Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone. Your journey, our passion. This is Auto Line After Hours with Peter DiLorenzo, episode 219 for November 15th, 2013. Luxury Bandwidth. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time or 2300 GMT. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or by following the links on our website. Hey everyone, McElroy here. I'm out traveling, so I can't be on the show tonight. But before you get going, I wanted to remind you to tune in for our special webcast from the LA Auto Show next week. It's brought to you by our signature sponsor, Hyundai, and it will be live on Wednesday, November 20th at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 1 p.m. Pacific. We have a great lineup of guests, including Joe Hendricks from Ford, Paul Ferrilo, the product planner for BMW North America, and Scott Keogh, who runs Audi of America. Be sure to check out our growing list and submit your questions to us at our website at autoline.tv or use the Twitter hashtag LAAS Live. One more time, that live show brought to you by Hyundai starts at 4 p.m. Eastern Time on Wednesday, November 20th, so save the day. And with that, I hand it back over to Peter. Grazie Gianni. Welcome folks. It's another scintillating episode of AutoLine After Hours. And we're pleased and proud to be here, as an old ad guy used to tell me. Gary Vasilash, welcome. Auto yeah, automotive right. Design Production. Mr. Todd Lasso from Automobile. Todd, always a pleasure. Likewise, Peter. And Frank Marcus from Motor Trend. Frank, how are you? I'm just super. Peter, how are you doing? We're, we're all doing well tonight. And, you know, we have a lot to talk about. Uh, we don't have an official guest because, you know, we're pretty happening guys ourselves, so we don't need a guest tonight, <laughs> right? Of course. So, say so. Yeah. So one thing, um, we talked about it earlier. Frank, tell us about uh, Motor Trends Car of the Year. Car of the Year, Cadillac CTS. Uh, Cadillac's been on the hard climb up to respectability and so forth. And to us, the CTS is like the first car that really goes toe to toe with the German competition, the E-Class, the you know five series, the A6. Um, it looks the part. The, the the changes they've made, the proportioning, the dash to axle, just the detailing of the exterior, unbelievable interior, very upscale. Uh, it, it might be just a shade off of, of of Audi, but probably right in there with I think you know the Mercedes and better than BMW as far as I'm concerned. Um, great uh, bandwidth, you know, t the two liter actually works great. We tried one of those with an with the uh, all wheel drive, which you would think would be the worst case. Plenty of power. The V6 was actually kind of the you know the the least impressive, and the V6 twin turbo. Oh my God, you know they're doing. V8 performance, turn twin turbo V8 performance with a twin turbo V6. So that's 420 horsepower. Yeah. It's a fabulous car. It competes with the, uh, they say it competes with the BMW 550 and, um, and of course is lighter. Uh, I think they say 400 pounds lighter than the BMW. Exactly. On the engineering excellence front from Motor Trends criteria, very high as far as those things go. The, uh, the Cadillac user interface, not everyone loves it, but I, personally a lot of us think, hey, that thing is making steps in the right direction. Uh, just, just a lot of impressive gear in that car. I actually have to say, I think that's still an Achilles, Achilles heel, I think. Uh, and, and I can't say, I, uh, you know, I did the initial drive of the car for, for automobile and um, gave it a pretty glowing review. But we have a long term, a four season ATS in our, in our fleet. Uh, and I just hate Q. I mean, I cannot get anything between on, on full blast and off with the fan, with the radio, I mean, it's just really hard. Develop that, that sensitive touch. I, uh, you know, I even, uh, uh, Dave Leone even gave me some pointers on how to use it, and I tried it afterward, and I think it's, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think it's user failure. I think it's uh, software or hardware failure. And Dave Leone is the chief engineer for that oh, car. Sorry, yeah, and, uh, exactly. and we've had, a, had right. Dave on this show not too long sure. ago. And it gets to the point that you were making about how 
the OEM seemed so hell-bent on doing things like infotainment systems, including the queue, rather than mm -hmm. saying, hey, there are smart guys who know how to do that. Why don't you turn Yeah, I, you know, if, if I'm making that call to manufacturer, I'm going to go visit uh, Google or whoever and just say, look, here's a space in our car. We're willing to let you show us your idea for that because we clearly can't really do much with it. And, and see, but that's against everything. That's against the grain of every manufacturer because they want to own it, they want to control it, they want to build it, and they want to make the money from it. Only after the fact do they realize, well, if we piss off half of our customers, that's not really very good, is it? So I don't know. The best, the best systems for the customers going forward w will be knobs for the radio and for the HVAC. And you put your own tablet or your own smartphone on the dash, yeah. not use. You and know, speaking the, of knobs, I, I we just the the new MKC, the Lincoln production vehicle, is going to be shown in LA next week, and it's a real departure on the console, which is it's a beautiful interior. But they they went back to knobs. I mean, they clearly are showing us that, you know, they, especially Ford. You know, they've had their issues, but they're listening, and I I think. They made the right move. I think eventually I would like to see a manufacturer, you can order, a, you check a box where you have knobs and a radio and then a map that pulls out of the day. <laughs> Doesn't it seem like a, we've had this discussion <laughs> multiple times. Yeah. They've, they've gone away from buttons, from knobs to buttons and back multiple times. I don't know if people just retire and new guys come in and have that new idea and they have to be, have it beaten yeah. out of them again. And, you know, I drove to the uh, a local preview of the uh, MKC with uh, one of our young guys, just hired uh, web guys um, to, to see the, the MKC. And he's, I don't know, 22 or 23 years old, and we had a discussion about that on the way. And he agreed with me. Knobs, buttons are way better than the screen. So it's not a, uh, an old fart versus young guy sort of thing. That's what everybody wants. But it was interesting. I was, I was talking to Lisa Drake, who's the chief engineer on MKC yesterday. And, you know, you think, you know, a knob is a knob, you know, no big deal. And she said that it is, it is the, to get the right feel that they wanted for that, knob that they're using so they have a knob for the for the uh volume and then for the um you know um selector um radio station, station yeah, selector right and she said it's, it's like an assembly of 10 pieces that they have to put together to to make it just right so you know you'd think that basically what they want to do is say okay if we can get rid of mechanical things we have to put together and we're able to just do it in software where people get to swipe things and poke things and and do whatever well, they save dough right and, of course, yeah. gesture recognition is the new frontier. And will that be a case where, okay, yeah, I can go like this in midair, and I've, I've got my virtual knob? Well, we've been living with gesture recognition since man started driving automobiles <laughs> when they flipped off the other guy on the road. But, you know, uh, getting back to Formula One a lot, gesture yeah. recognition, yeah. But getting back to Cadillac, <laughs> they've been on this journey, and when we'll come back to Lincoln, but... Cadillac's been on this journey since they introduced the Evoke concept car, which I believe was 99 in Detroit or 98. Pebble Beach, yeah, actually, before yeah. The, the auto show. I mean, way back. Yep. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a battle. And um, I'm going to drive the CTS coming up here in a uh, week or so. But everything I've heard is the feel of the car is finally, you know, Competitive, and I it's mean, coming at a time when the Germans are starting to lose it and and add this what I call a layer of of uh, isolation. Well, BMW especially. I mean, unless you order a five series properly, when you get in it, uh, it doesn't feel like a BMW. Yeah, and and we've also seen uh, today the the new marketing director for Cadillac, who used to work at at uh, BMW and. Uh, Mont Blanc. Is that Mont Blanc of all things? Yeah. But he, at least he admitted that. He said that it will take at least 10 years for Cadillac to get to where they were. Another 10 the, years. Another I mean, 10 years on top I, of. All the, yeah, in Europe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, but I mean, I think to a certain extent in the United States as well. I, I think maybe they're closer ten, here. Maybe not 10 years, but. I thought those comments were mostly referring to over there. I think that's what yeah. you meant. Yeah. See, I, you know, if I was making the call on that, I wouldn't bother with Europe if I was Cadillac at all. I would try to shore up what's going on here and push everything to China. 
I mean, because that's where the money is. I think there's a little bit, I think there's a kind of an acknowledgement that uh, for a brand like Cadillac or for what's supposed to be a global luxury brand, that because of this, because of the internet, that um, younger buyers, the buyers you want to cultivate and have for the next 10 or 20 or 30 years or more, know all these international brands now. And they want to buy what's big in Europe. So Cadillac needs to be an international brand. Lincoln maybe doesn't need to be an international brand. I think uh, despite how much they, um, uh, they dispute it, they're taking pretty much a Buick uh, um, philosophy or a Buick, following the Buick playbook with China. But Cadillac, I think, needs to be international, including Europe. But is that is that is that just related to, to automobiles in terms of? I mean, if we think of all consumer products, oh, sure. does it? I mean, does it does it matter if you know you, you have a Whirlpool appliance, or does it need to be a Bosch appliance? And does it matter to you whether Whirlpool sells in Germany or not? I mean, it's, I mean it's, it matters it's, to some people, no question. But I mean, is there yeah, a sufficient that, number of people where you would put all these resources in? Convincing the Europeans, but that, that, yeah, that, that, those aren't fashion deal. and lifestyle, you know, purchases, which a car is. You know, you're telling the world something about yourself. A car is a fashion business. Well, look, right. and, and look, Cadillac is never going to win Germany, which is where all the money is and where you know. With the well, that's of that's what I meant. I didn't economy. I didn't mean Cadillac should write off Europe. Yeah. But as you mentioned, specifically in Germany, I mean, you know, the, they're for the home team there. Yeah. But if they have a little bit of local presence, if they are, you know, even what Maserati, Maserati might be in, in Germany right now, um, that's more important than just, I think, ignoring it completely and saying, well, just move on to China. Well, you have to be there, but yeah. good luck with that. And if the cars are legitimately better, if they're lighter, faster, more efficient, Okay, you you know sooner or later people over there are going to say you know if nothing else it'll drive the Germans in that direction. Well, but. the CTS is the first straight up you know give us what you got we're going to be as good or if not better. So the ATS is pretty good. The CTS you know is going to be that car. So we. And the, and the thing that's also worth mentioning on CTS is uh, they know they're kind of really in that space now and they're charging. Oh yeah, that's right. that's the other thing. Now you're, you're not getting a big discount on a CTS. Like you about five thousand dollars less than a comparable Mercedes or BMW. Uh, maybe it, to start, I, but when you get them start. with some stuff, they're they're yeah. pretty well, close. Well, the interesting thing when the ATS push was last year, the ATS and the CTS were right on top of each other, and the CTS fell off the the map at the dealer level. Sure. Uh, because they had those two cars, and now they've got the strategy, they've got the ATS, they've got the CTS, and they've got the XTS. Now, the XTS is in no way, shape, or form a 7 Series competitor, but the ATS and the CTS are 3 and 5 Series competitors. And uh, it's going to be interesting, but they're asking all the money for the new CTS. And it deserves that money, whether people... Think, believe that it should get that money, we'll find out. And I hope there's, there's not that, oh. tons of money on the hood right off the bat. Well, you know? and, and I think that's where uh, the comments about how Cadillac needs 10 years in Europe can apply to the U.S. I think we're still going to see lower ATPs, uh, more discounting on the Cadillac versus a comparable BMW or Mercedes for quite some time. I think it'll be a little while before they can get there and not have to discount the, the way they have in the past. Yeah. See, it'll be interesting to watch the numbers because let's say you owned a CTS and now you're going into the dealer to buy the new CTS and you see... It's going to be an, a 10 grand hit right. over and above what you remember paying. Sure. And what is that going to do to the numbers? We're now, you know, we're now paying mid-sized car prices for compact cars. So, I mean, there, there's there's a bit of that bump that people should expect. But you're right. I mean, it's it, you know, what it comes down to is what's the lease payment going to be because that's where these cars sell or where they should be selling and where Cadillac needs to get into more of a lease buyer, mm -hmm. a, a lease owner program rather than, you know, to have the same sort of numbers that BMW and Mercedes has in leases and Audi. Well, I wish that gentleman luck. I mean, there's some built-in problems that he's going to face, the, the gentleman from BMW to be head of Cadillac Marketing. One is uh, he's reporting to Amway Bob Ferguson, uh, <laughs> who was just plucked out of obscurity by uh, Captain Queeg because on a whim to, hey, you're a smart guy, you run Cadillac. 
So there's that. And then you have the moribund uh, GM marketing organization, which, you know, a lot of people still there entrenched. So he's got his hands full. Uh, whatever preconceived notions he's bringing, it'll be entirely different, I can assure him. Now, Frank, you're driving an interesting Cadillac. Yes, the XTS V-Sport, which, you know, that car has been kind of a, a guilty pleasure. I, I know as a Motor Trend enthusiast guy, I'm not supposed to like the big, dumb, front-wheel drive-based, you know, placeholder for the 16, you know, or whatever that's coming down the pike. But I liked that car from the first time I looked at it. It's got that big rear overhang that I remember from when I was a kid, you know, the four off a trunk, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know, and now that it's got all this power... And, you know, it's, it's really nice. And this is a platinum on top of the line, so the interior's got all this lovely wood. And, yeah, I quite like running around in that car. I, you know, I had the XTS, not the V-Sport, but I like the car, and I think the interior is really nicely done. It's, it's, it's very nice. It's very done, impressive. You know? which, which is important because you have the car is basically, you know, shares the platform with the uh, Buick LaCrosse now with the Chevy Impala. And, boy, the Impala is right on top of the LaCrosse, and not that far down from the, not as far down from the Cadillac as maybe it should be. In fact, I've noticed that with the new, uh, with the update on the LaCrosse, they've added real wood to the dash to have a little bit of a separation from the Chevy. Um, I, yeah, I, I understand how you feel. It's a nice car to drive. Uh, to me, the, the front drive or all-wheel drive Cadillac is, is the China car. It's not the car you want to bring into Europe. Uh, I don't know if it's a placeholder. I've I've heard and reported that uh, that they're looking at a next generation version of the car, and and I'm guessing that's largely on the strength of China and here, uh, and maybe uh, you know with the standard XTS, some livery sales too. They've they've tried to grab some. It's people. the outlier though. It's like Cadillac's yeah. really they're trying to go in this rear drive dimension that you know ATS, CTS, and whatever comes next over there, and right. and this thing is kind of off on an eddy current. But it's it's cool looking, and I you know I. So, so when you were saying that it, it reminds you of vehicles of your youth, does it remind you of Cadillacs of your youth? And, and is yeah, because in, in my youth they were audacious and in your face, and oh my god, you know, cool sure. in, in certain ways. And and this one, you know, it, it has all that look to it. You know. No, I, I I thought you know when I drove that car, my my reaction was much like yours. It was like. Wow, this is a Cadillac. Yeah. You know what I mean? And and when I was thinking that, I was not thinking about ATS hmm. or, or, C or CTS. Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking of days gone by yeah. and it had the plushness, the well, the comfort, the amenities that one would expect of that that's car. That's a good point. I mean, I wrote about this a few weeks ago I, and and I've hit at it a few times, but it's okay for Cadillac to be Cadillac. I get the, oh, we're, we're going to out Nürburgring the Germans. I get that positioning. And by the way, I'm thankful Lincoln didn't do that. Uh, but, you know, it's okay for Cadillac to be Cadillac. I mean, there's some residual goodness of Cadillac. And in this, this you know, this hell-bent, we're going to out Nürburgring the Germans, you know, you get in an XTS and you say, hey, you know, this is pretty cool. It's a pretty nice car. Well, and to your point, if the CTS V, uh, if the CTS V Sport was a good handling car but didn't have a Cadillac kind of ride to go with it, then it would have been a failure. Right. Uh, the fact that they could get uh, make a car that handles and still rides like a Cadillac uh, makes it a success. They're getting good bandwidth out of that magnet ride but engine. It, exactly. Yeah. It's it, it's really more important for that to be a Cadillac to have a good ride. So I agree with you there. There's no question. You know. And you know, back to Lincoln and the MKC. I, the MKC has a real shot at being successful in the market. I think. The one thing that impressed me with it is the. I was impressed with the leather. Believe it or not, it was a soft, buttery kind of leather that you don't expect in what is basically their entry vehicle. It's a C uh, segment uh, crossover, um, and very obviously based on the uh, Ford Escape, even though it doesn't look anything like the Ford Escape. Yeah, no, it doesn't. It's it's also lower and wider, and the detailing throughout is is impressive. And I think they're gonna they're really gonna hit. The sweet spot in the market with that with this car, um, you know. But Lincoln, you know, it's it's hard because when you're over there trying to get this brand relaunched, uh, you start saying, "Well, it's going to take ten years," and you know, 
Everybody. Ten years Ten of years not of, second guessing yourself yeah. three years in. Yeah. And, and, and uh, everybody's already looking at their the watch. Clock. They're yeah. already looking at their watches over there. Plus, ten, ten, what it needs is 10 years and an exclusive car, which they don't have. They well, don't they need an exclusive car, and I think they need an exclusive factory. They need to set aside a plant, say, that's where we're going to build Lincolns. You know, maybe that but, will get. But, I, I but, think that, but, that's okay, but, pie in the sky. Yeah, oh, it and, is pie in the sky. And, and what no. I mean, but what difference does does that make? So, so for that car, for the for the the MKC, so they're going to build it in Louisville, where they're building the Escape. Um, although, as you point out, it's wider, so you know the the track is is different. Yeah. But you know they're just expanding the platform. But you know they have you know an exclusive paint shop for it. They've got um, technology that's not being used for analyzing the paint in terms of they're going to take a picture of every body panel and compare it to a golden panel to make sure there's no flaws and they're going to have um, special inspection yeah well what I'm what I'm getting at is it's almost it's almost as about about the internal organization as anything they have to be consistent they have to be focused, and they can't waver on the mission for Lincoln. And there's constant people off to the sides throwing in grenades and getting, you know, a little shaky about it. And they've got to stay the course. And if a plant would do that for them internally, maybe, you know, the replacement for the big Lincoln coming, maybe that should have its own plant. I don't know. It's just... It's all part of this image wrangling thing. And the image wrangling is both external and internal in these companies because, let's face it, they're going to need a lot of money to get Lincoln re relaunched. And let's not forget what they're, what they're doing, at least in the short term, to try to separate it from Ford. And they're, they're basically taking the ac accurate playbook. In this case, they're, they're playing up the concierge service. It's all about the service. It's about the experience of, of owning the, the vehicle well. Is there anything special in owning the vehicle? That's that's the big question. That's the big question they have to answer to sell some of them. Yeah, and I'd be careful of that because uh, I wrote about the democratization of luxury this week, which we'll get to. But uh, all of that customer service stuff, that's all going to be the price entry. Yep. I mean, I, I joke about it, but eventually your dealer's going to deliver your newspaper. You know, I mean, it's just, you know... Everyone's going to have, have anything it. else to do because you all have ordered it online. Yeah, so, yeah, so. yeah. What newspaper is the other <laughs> yeah. question? I guess. Well, yeah, deliver your newspaper that's <laughs> on your iPad. Maybe they give you a new <laughs> iPad every day. I don't know. Well, and and that is a that's a very touchy. I mean, you have to. You're counting on dealers uh, finding people who who provide good service. But you know, ultimately, yeah. where does it come back to? The product. But, you know, so the, oh. so the question, you know, we were talking about luxury car and what's Cadillac and, you know, that that Lincoln wants to regain what it had lost in terms of its its level of prestige in the market, in terms of being a luxury mark that we, we recognize. And, and um, I mean, the MKC is not going to be available till summer 2014. So they learned the lesson from the launch of the MKZ that this time they're going to make sure it's it's right. And so it's going to you know, come out on time. But the thing that I wonder about is, is, you know, the pricing of that, they, they pointed out that it is going to be approximately $5,000 less than a, than a Q3 or an, a, a Q5 or an X3. And to, to sort of come out that way, does, does that connote luxury to say, well, we've got this one, but it'll be less expensive than our computer? Bargain luxury? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe they shouldn't talk about price right now. Yeah, and they you did. Know, Farley came out and said it yesterday. They can charge what those guys are charging when they've earned it, like now CTS has after all these years. They're nowhere near there now. It has to be cheaper. Yeah. Yeah. So, what else? Uh, Gary, you had something to talk about. Uh, some research that's just been... Well, yeah, it was it's sort of interesting. So um, this consultancy, um, Booz & Company, does a survey every year of um, who spends on R&D, and they look at every industry in the world, and it's the Global Innovation 1000. Okay, so, I mean, they're, they're looking far and wide, and so this is, this is every type of industry all around the world. They look everywhere. And, uh, you know, and it gives you a pretty good sense of who the technology leaders are. And, you know... It, it often strikes me that many people tend to think that the auto industry 
is a not particularly innovative place, that the auto industry is, is behind and the consumer electronics and, and Apple and Google are the ones who are, who are doing it all. And I, and I found it fascinating, this, is, this just came out in the number, the, the ranked number one in the world, and this is, this is based um, on R&D spending, um, is Volkswagen. Volkswagen spends $11.4 billion that's but but they must be R talking &D. about a That's percentage. The so the Volkswagen Group. Yeah, the, the entire Volkswagen Group. And right. so, I mean, so it's no. This, these are these are raw dollars that they're spending because if you look at their their uh, as a percentage of revenue, they're not number one by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, well, okay. okay. So, I, I, so so number two, Samsung, which one would think would be oh they're they're spending more than Volkswagen certainly would. They're at ten point four billion dollars. So actually, you have a car company that's outspending Samsung, Rocher Holdings, a pharmaceutical company, Intel, Microsoft, and then number six is Toyota. I, w I would rank, rank them by point. percentage, yeah. though. I, how, yeah, what's your total uh, either gross revenue or even, well, yeah, I have to do gross revenue. Because net income yeah. is probably still Tesla's well. not going to show up on there either, and they're pretty innovative. You know? right. Well, the thing about it is, uh, this goes back to when Washington was was taking uh, the auto industry out back to the woodshed, you know, five years ago. Uh, they had to be reminded that, uh, I hate to say it, but, you know, the auto companies are one of the big parts of the U.S. research uh, ability. Mm -hmm. And they had to, you know, the auto companies had to basically educate Washington in three months or less back then. And uh, one of the things they had to be reminded of is you know, there's a lot of research done by the auto companies that people don't know about. And this just happens to, you know. Sure. So it's, it seems that, you know, the, the level of technology that permeates everything these guys are doing is is going to be not only you're going to have services being the price of entry, but you know level of technology being the price of entry. So you know you talk about you know the Tesla being an innovative company in terms of the the things they're doing, but you know you wonder can that scale? Can they you know compete against a Volkswagen or a Toyota or or a Daimler or a General Motors in terms of just raw dollars that they're able to give to researchers at, at universities or at companies to uh, pull this sort of stuff off. Hmm. So it, it could be a uh, completely changing environment. It'd be interesting to break that down too on, you know, how much of that is pure Volkswagen, how much of it is dealing with suppliers. Um, you know, the, a lot of the tier one suppliers do a lot of the R&D. Um, so do they count Volkswagen buying? This is their spend. Uh -huh. so, so they spend that. So if they give money to Siemens to do R and D, or sure. to, you know that that would be part of their spend. Sure, because Tesla, at least at least in the public comments, uh, it, it sounds like Elon Musk wants to do it all himself. When he announced that he was going to have a semi-autonomous car uh, in two years, uh, he tweeted uh, for for job openings uh, for engineers to make this happen. Uh, whereas, of course, everybody else has been working on it for. 20 years or more and and largely uh, in in uh, cahoots with uh, the tier one suppliers so um, you know there's a big difference there I think between um, some of those other companies and the automakers in terms of what they uh, uh, spend on R&D mm -hmm. so what else were you talking about some licensed drivers or something well yeah so uh, this is another uh, study these guys from uh, uh, University of Michigan um, Transportation Research Institute. Um, I, I, I was looking at this. They, they were looking at um, a couple of things. When they, when they were looking at the number of miles driven, the number of um, people driving, and um, one of the things that they discovered was that um, they looked at the number of people who are 19 years old who have driver's licenses. And um, so in 1983, 87.3% of 19 year olds had driver's licenses. By 2008, that was down to 75.5%. And in 2010, it was 69.5%. So here we have it in 1983, 87%. 
2010, 69%. So, so the question becomes, I mean, is, is this an ever-diminishing well, sort of a number? Well, I keep hearing from, from people that, you know, their kids are just getting their licenses in their 20s uh, because they just didn't need one up until then. They were driven around everywhere, and they, you know, they just never wanted to I, have one. I, I don't understand parents these days, I guess. Uh, you know, uh, the only one in my family that... Has a, the minute the, you know my nephew turned 16, you know we got him a car. You know I'm tired of running you everywhere. You know. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 it's just well, it's a different. There might be. I mean, part of it is that uh, supposedly after the after the Great Recession, um, we've had f the families, the type of families that used to have three or four or five cars, maybe uh, a couple of them at least were leased. Perhaps now might be back down to two cars or. I don't know, maybe in one car, depending on the location and uh, the, the economic um, the, um, the resources of the family. But um, so, what if that makes a difference that uh, you only have two cars uh, per household, and uh, before the kid gets to be 19 years old, uh, he or she doesn't have the opportunity to go out and drive as much? Well, I keep hearing the financial um, issue, but there's. I think what this survey is getting at is a fun fundamental lack of want to. Yeah. Here. I mean, you know, it's just a different time. I mean, when we grew up, I mean, I was taking my parents' cars out when I was 14. Yeah. And, I mean, you just couldn't wait. Sure. There isn't that. I don't. That's... I bought my first car when I was 15, and it was a Mustang turning 50 this year. Yay. <laughs> Well, on that note, we're going to take a little break here, and uh, we're going to hear from our friends at Bridgetown Firestone and also have some exciting auto line uh, promotional materials to distribute. Introducing a car company that's never made a single car. Legendary durability. Impressive mileage. Firestone tires. So unstrap the saddle. These old stallions are ready to run. Again. Whatever you drive, drive a Firestone. Whether it's on television, online, or through social media, AutoLine knows how to effectively get your marketing message to the people you want to reach. Contact Stacy Eman today. Okay, we're back. We just wanted to remind you that we're giving away, Gary, a black and gray gym slash duffel bag. Wait a minute. That was the one on the bottom. Oh. <laughs> nice preparation there, Gary. Yeah, with the new Corvette logo and uh, a dark gray XL T-shirt with the new Corvette logo on the front and a black notebook with new Corvette symbol stamped on the front and back. Now, <laughs> all you have to do to be eligible is to, what? Yeah, poster, uh, but there's a bunch of stuff here. All you have to do is to be eligible is be as- He's not even doing my gestures. Is a subscriber. You gotta be a subscriber to AutoLine's email newsletter. Just sign up on AutoLine.tv by clicking on the daily email link. Now, if you're already a subscriber, congratulations, you're already eligible. We'll be selecting a winner at random from our entire pool of subscribers on Wednesday, November 20th. If you're the winner, we'll contact you and ask for your U.S. mailing address so we can send you the prizes. Hmm. Let's just think. There are four things. One, we're three. not eligible, Frank. Dang. No, we're not. <laughs> we see um, this stuff all the time. Okay, another thing that just blew up, but, you know, I was kind of surprised. It was so old news that I didn't understand. I think Reuters just, somebody was clamoring that we got to do something. So they reported yet again that Dan, Captain Quig Ackerson, is leaving uh, sometime next year. Uh, you know, I've been writing that he's going to be leaving about next May for about four months now. Um, but given that Dan's Dan, he just had to respond to an automotive news query, and and they and he said, well, you know, it should be a change agent replacing me, and you know, blah blah blah, and you know, it's just like, well, first of all, um, it's not his call, and uh, 
he doesn't have the board in his pocket, which, you know, people, none of these articles talk about because they don't, they don't know what's going on on the board. Uh, he has been personally trying to promote Mary Barra into the job. Uh, and it's a not so subtle campaign. And from what I'm understanding, the board has not so subtly pushed back and said, thank you, but, you know, no thanks. So we shall see. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I think Ackerson will, will leave sometime next late spring. Uh, GM will be out of the, uh, or the government will be out of the GM business come, I'm guessing, February at the latest. And that's what's going to happen. So he'll be there long enough to get a, get some sort of new package. Um, oh, he'll be long enough. They're long already enough. changing his to get uh, paid. stock compensation. Oh, I think. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That's all part of the deal. I mean, the... You know, that's because uh, what we're getting at is that the, the government, uh, uh, with its partial ownership of GM, set limits on uh, executive compensation. So. Yeah, and that's that's hurt the company uh, for sure. They haven't been able to recruit. Uh, they've sort of had to pat their top employees on the head and say, "Keep hanging in there. Keep hanging in there. We'll get out of this." And so, so who's leaving first, Akerson or Mulally? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I think we'll we'll know that pretty soon. Oh, the old Microsoft long shot. Question, Maybe they'll right? do like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that'd be fun. <laughs> Other news today. Uh, one of my favorites, Dario Franchitti, announced his retirement from racing today. He had a horrible wreck at the IndyCar race in Houston um, about five weeks ago, six weeks ago, uh, or longer actually. But. Uh, in doctor's orders said, you know, he really can't take another hit. Um, now, Dario had a couple of severe crashes at Michigan International Speedway in Indy cars. He had a bad wreck in NASCAR. Uh, he had a motorcycle wreck uh, in his personal time. But, uh, you know, he was very lucky. Uh, it was it was similar. Uh, if you're seeing the picture there. When he get when those cars go up in the catch fencing, uh, the driver's helmet, uh, the top of the car is exposed. That's how Dan Weldon lost his life. Um, and but Dario is, is one of the classiest individuals to have ever donned a racing suit. He's a wonderful guy and a wonderful ambassador for the sport, and um, he has a respect for racing history that's unmatched in modern drivers, which is very appreciated, appreciated because it's, it's nice to see. So wish him the best. And this is a reminder, Peter, that, you know, just kind of like what we're relearning about uh, the NFL with a lot of injuries lately, that it's still a very dangerous sport. As, as yeah. much as we've gotten used to much safer cars in the last uh yeah, we have year, gotten year. we have gotten used to it. Uh, you know, of course, NASCAR cars have since Dale Earnhardt lost his life at Daytona. You know, they redid the whole NASCAR thing, the Hans device. But uh, you know, Dario's injuries were such that he can't afford another. Uh, I think with his neck uh, and spine. So, but when you look at that, those images, that it's encouraging in some ways that he's able to announce. That yeah. he's retiring yeah. that that yeah. I mean in not that long ago an accident like that would have been yeah you know um, game over and so, so yeah I'm I'm uh, grateful that he's retiring at 40 won the Indianapolis 500 three times he wanted to become only the fourth person to win it four times the other three are AJ Foyt Alan Sir Sr. and Rick Mears um, Dario won the IndyCar championship uh, he's just a, he's a great driver, and I'm glad he's getting to retire at 40. He can live the rest of his life. So what else are we going to talk about today? We've talked about Lincoln. What about, what's bugging you, Todd? I know there's something bugging you tonight. Something bugging me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we were talking about the uh, uh, We might as well talk about by calm, which is the democratization of luxury. That was a good subject. Which, uh, you know, what I was trying to get, first of all, we're all familiar and our viewers out there are familiar with the term democratization of technology, which is the phenomenon that's been going on probably forever. But uh, auto companies 
innovate and introduce their ultimate technologies on their show pony concept cars or on racing cars or on futuristic concept cars. And eventually that technology, you know, filters down to their lesser products. And so uh, the, what's happening now is this, you know, you're seeing this technology creep down into the segments. Uh, and the, the example I gave was direct fuel injection, mm -hmm. which was first developed a century ago, but then subsequently came into prominence with the onset of the sophistication of electronics. Um, and now you can get a bunch of four-cylinder engines across the entire industry that have direct fuel injection. So that's, that's a, a clear-cut example. But what I'm talking about now is the democratization of luxury. And example number one is the new Mercedes-Benz CLA, which comes in at $29,995. And, um, you know, this car has sparked a lot of discussion. And uh, the point of my column was that Mercedes has to be careful because eventually uh, the image, there's a chance of image degrada degradation going on here. And they are, they are willing to bet that they will overcome any of that. Um, that's, you know, that remains to be seen. I, I uh, you know, CLA is uh, interesting. I mean, you know, you can see why it costs twenty nine nine ninety five if you really look at it, and really more like thirty five thousand. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you trend. can see, but if you, when I look back at the C class sport coupe some years ago, that was a cynical play. Oh well, you're talking about Way, the C two thirty compressor, yeah, that thing which I mentioned. That was, was a pretty disaster. terrible. Yeah. It was pretty terrible, and it was a car that was. You know, um, not unusual for Mercedes Benz in Europe, where where, yeah. where we all we've talked about the C class uh, taxi cabs in Germany. I mean, uh, you know, it's and, I, and I'm concerned if they bring B class and A class hatchbacky ovoids over here. That, I think that's a, a probably a bad idea. And okay, fine, the electric one, whatever. But this car, I quite like the way it goes down the road. Yeah, the back seat is too small. Um, if it only had two doors, no one would care. It, they put some doors back there so that the kids can let themselves in and out a little easier. But it is for little kids back there, as far as I'm concerned. I think it's good looking. It, it reminds me of a, of a GTI, just to drive it around. Yeah, I, you know, the thing about it is, uh, I had this conversation with Dieter Zetsche many years ago, and he couldn't understand why the U.S. was so concerned about Mercedes going into lower segments. He said, well, you know, like you said, we have taxi cabs. I said, Dieter, yes, Mercedes in Germany, yeah, they're Mercedes taxi cabs, they're Mercedes trucks, there's Mercedes everything. Over here, you planted your image stake in the ground with engineered like no other car in the world. For a while there, Mercedes was definitely a cut above everything else. And now you're saying, and of course, you know, we saw this degradation going on. They come out with the Maybach. Yeah. What's that, Dieter? Well, that's the ultimate Mercedes. Well, wait a minute. I thought you're, you're telling the Mercedes S-Class owner, the guy who just shelled out 100, or woman who just shelled out 130000 for his S-Class, that, well, no, that's not our ultimate car. This is. I mean, Mercedes has been all over the map. The thing, the problem I have with the CLA is, uh, yeah, they keep showing us the AMG version, and yeah, that's cool and everything, but, uh, you know, at that price point, even though transaction prices are going to be, I mean, when you get to the dealer, the cars are all like 36, 37, 38,000. First thing it's going to do is it's going to cannibalize C-Class sales. I think it's really going to devastate push, this. And push those prices up, too. Well, yeah, but I think it's going to just cut the legs out of the C-Class. And um, I think eventually what's happened is there used to be a distinction for Mercedes, and now they've just announced that they're in the Hyundai Kia game. But it, isn't, the, isn't the fundamental question, what is the bandwidth of luxury? Well. Okay, and, and so, so well, could, they, could they have a B-Class or an A-Class and, and engineer it like no other vehicle? 
Yeah, but see, in, they've they've got charge for it. They've yeah. gotten away from engineered like no other vehicle. And in the uh, the automobile industry since um, uh, since Sloan, but separate from what Ford did, has been predicated on the idea that you always want to move up. And uh, to me, this car, what this car really is, is a competitor. You're you're not you're going to think I don't know what I'm talking about, but it's a competitor for the Chevrolet Camaro and Ford Mustang. Um, in the late 1990s, that car was the Audi A4. It was the car you would recommend to people who said, oh, I love my Toyota, it's going to run forever, but I've had four of them on board with them, and I've got a little bit more money, what do I spend it on? You get an Audi A4. Uh, when, the, when the Chevy Camaro came out, it revitalized the Mustang uh, category, made, made it a car that you would buy that would be a little bit outside of what you'd normally get from Chevy or, or Ford. It's not for a family car. The back seat is bad in any of them. Um, but it, it was something that was a little bit different, a little bit special. Um, it might be the kind of car that would uh, maybe get that 19-year-old to finally get his driver's license. It's that sort of thing. And they're all hovering around thirty dollars to $35,000, depending on how you, um, how you order it, if you get a decent amount of equipment in it. So I think that's what they're trying to do with this car. That's what Audi's going to do with, with, with its main competitor, which will be the uh, new A3 sedan coming out soon, and uh, just barely undercutting it in price, I believe. Um, that's what this car is set out to do. Now, whether that's going to do it for more than a year, I think the car is going to probably do pretty well in the U.S. in its first year after that is the big question. It's, it's like the old coupe. So, so do people uh, buy it because it's a luxury car, or do they buy it because it's a Mercedes, they or do they buy it because it's a Mercedes? Or, they, or because it's a European car? No, they're buying it because it's a deal <laughs> on a Mercedes. But it's a, Merce it's a Mercedes, and, and outside of the enthusiast crowd, Mercedes is still the brand. It's not BMW, it's not... Yeah, Audi. and it really does look the part. It's not like it's a 40-foot... Mercedes, you know it. It's well, got that CLS look to it, which I, now you know there was a lot of dis, you know dissension in the car of the year ranks, where design is one of our big pillars, and our design experts, you know, like Tom Gale, just hated the back end of that car. So it looked melted in the stove or whatever. I I personally kind of like it, uh, and I think a lot of people do like that, you know, that look, that four door coupe look. It's going on. All the fancy, expensive cars have it. Yeah. So I, I don't well, think it, it's a bad play. Well, the other thing about Mercedes that what the, the foothold uh, it made in the United States was, as you said, Peter, engineered like a car, like no other car. Is engineering. It wasn't really. Uh, if you compared it to luxury car for luxury car to a Cadillac at the time, it was not as plush as a Cadillac. It was, it was a better engineered. Different point of view. Yeah, uh, and and so. Uh, they may be getting back to the roots a bit. Um, I, I, I agree with you to a certain extent because you now have, you know, Ford and, as I point out, Chevy kind of reaching up into that area. So you've got the entry cars and the luxury cars meeting somewhere in the, at that point and which one's going to work out better. But um, the other thing is that they, you know, they, they do have engineering uh, built into that car if you look at the AMG which is a lot more expensive, of course. It's close to $50,000, but they just announced an EPA highway number of either 30 or 31 for that car, and it's what a, how many horsepower is that, Frank? I don't remember, 200 and... No, it's three, oh, 359 or something. It's way up there, yeah. It's the most the powerful... 300s, it's 345. Liter yeah. turbo, yeah. Well, I mean, there's a lot of things going on in this. First of all, Daimler as an entity off to itself in the automotive world is, you know, they are under severe financial pressure. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they keep putting cars out in multiple segments because they got to move some metal, they got to generate income because otherwise the alternative is they get bought by somebody. I, I, there's a lot going on to this, but we'll be talking about this for a while, I'm sure. Yeah. But right now, we're going to go to rapid fire. Okay, here we go. Eric Ambrose asks, is the tool dye shortage a big deal? Should I start a high-tech dye company? Sure. Very. <laughs> Good luck hiring the people to work for it. There's your answer. That's well, the tricky part. You can get a CNC machine, and as long as you know how to program, good to go. Yeah. Brian asks, the LA Auto Show is next week. Is there any product reveal you are looking forward to seeing now? Todd 
and Frank are going to be in Japan, but... We'll be at the Tokyo show. Yeah. Yes. First, my first time there in four years. Of course, it's held every, every two years, and they're trying to rebuild that show. Um, but there's a number of things at L.A. Um, the Colorado. New, the new Porsche Macan. Oh, right. Yeah. And... Uh, F-type uh, uh, coupe, the, yeah. F-type yeah, coupe, the, the Lexus uh, coupe. Yeah, the, our what is it? Our RC. RC. They're changing yeah. the name. They're they're pulling a BMW on it, where the it's basically the IS coupe. It's the new IS mm. coupe, but it's separate name, just like three series, four series. And the Porsche Macan, which will be interesting. That'll be interesting. Yeah. Dr. Botox asks, is the Hyundai Equus not a luxury car because it is a Hyundai? How much of the luxury perception depends upon heritage? We're going to oh, find that's that a luxury out. Car for sure. Well, it doesn't. Uh, if you if you buy Lexus uh, success early on, of course, that has really leveled off in the last few years. But uh, Lexus had a great success um, from 1990 into the you know until a few years ago as a luxury brand with no history whatsoever. And of course, Genesis is up for big things happening. And that's that redo is going to be. That'll really shift. Gorgeous. Uh, and the, the uh, fluidic sculpture 2.0 is. And of course, Hyundai, um, you know, went back and forth on whether it wanted to have a separate luxury channel or not and decided not to. Who knows? See, wouldn't that be the difference, though? You know, you're talking about the, the success that Lexus had in terms of being a luxury mark, that they didn't make it a Toyota. No. Good so, question. I mean, obviously, Volkswagen in this country had no luck with the uh, Phaeton, but they're still selling those in Germany. Um, it gets back to the old Ford versus GM thing. I mean, you know, if, if not for Ford, could have easily have gotten rid of Lincoln along with all of its PAG brands. Um, and you know, it's had a history of of kind of serving the, the market from base to fairly nice cars. Sure. Mike D. White asks, "What does the panel think of Cadillac ELR pricing?" I don't have a problem with it. I think it's fine. I don't I either. It's fine. I, and, and um, you know, it raises the old question of whether General Motors should have started with that car and maybe lost a little bit less per unit than it did on the Chevy Volt. But um, I, I think they're going to have some success with that car. Yeah. Miranda Lynn asks, I realize this is pie in the sky to ask, but is there any way that Chrysler employees or some entity can assist them in freeing them from fiat? Is there any way that Chrysler could be a standalone company again? Unfortunately, not. You can go in the tool and die business. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. And it's it, it's making the money for Fiat. Fiat's the Fiat's the anchor in that. As company. so often happens when someone buys Chrysler. Yeah, that's true. Steve B asks, why doesn't Chrysler slash Fiat make a large SUV based on their Ram trucks and sell it as a Dodge and or Jeep? Ram Charger. That's such a small market yeah. now, uh, although th those vehicles make money hand over fist. because 72% yeah. of the market is owned by General Motors on that one. Right. Yeah. They make tens of thousands. And of Expedition of has most of the rest of it, and then the little sequoias and things are just nibbling at the edges. And they still make the Lincoln Navigator. You almost have to remember that, but Lincoln still makes did, the Navigator. Did Aspen fit in that space, or is Aspen too small? Well, you know, a Aspen was a little bit of a tweener, because it was, um, you know, Durango was supposedly based off of the Dakota, which is which was a large mid-sized truck, but it wasn't quite full-sized. Yeah. This one's for you, Gary. G. Jason Anderson asks, I've heard many times on your show how profitable large body on frame trucks and SUVs can be for automobile manufacturers, now that we're talking about it. What exactly makes them more profitable? Are the raw materials less expensive, the engineering, development, manufacturing easier, or is the market just such that premium prices can be charged? D. <laughs> I, I, no, not I, really. Because now you can charge $25,000 for a pickup truck and make money on it. Yeah. Right? No, but people will pay more for a Tahoe, you know, than they will for a, an Impala, you know. But Gary, it's it, it's more to do the manufacturing of a body on frame is uh, is easier than unibody. Eh, not so much anymore. I mean, because just think about it. I mean, if 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 you if you look at the number of different types of vehicles that are built as unibody cars. I mean, you have the expertise there now that it, sure. it, it blows And you're making those and bodies that go on those frames almost unibodies anyway. Right. To keep them quiet and everything. Right. And, and so then the frames today versus the frames 
10, 15 years ago. I mean, there's just Everything so hydroformed. Yeah, so far changed. So, so there's a lot of money in there. I think what it comes down to is the fact, though, is that there is a greater willingness to pay money for a pickup truck, you know, from the get go. That you're gonna you're gonna say, okay, this is gonna cost me more money. There's a willingness Even though to pay more money for big. Right, and, but again, and so, we're talking about we're talking about this uh, large uh, SUV market be, being where all the money is in terms of the the, the markup in terms of the the uh, ATP, and and that's shrunk to such a small part of the market. It's still in pickup trucks, and a lot of pickup trucks are sold as fleet vehicles, and those certainly aren't that sure. Expensive. But but the thing you got to think about in terms of the the giant um, SUVs is that when um, gas prices went up in 2008, 2009, and when the economy crashed in 2008, 2009, then you began to see a precipitous decline in those things. Oh yeah, of course. And then if you look at the pickup truck, similarly um, back then, I mean, you look at F-150 sales, I mean, they lost like 25% just like that. That's come back because people need to buy pickup trucks by and large for fleets or because they're um, small business people or what have you. Right. You know, right, but my point is those those aren't necessarily marked up and you know, unless you're talking about the King ranches that get sold to Montana ranchers, I mean the the, the vast majority are still pickup trucks that go to right. fleets and to workmen and so on and but you could make okay. more money on the big SUV, but there are, are fewer people that are going to buy them. Therefore, right. you're going to right. get the economies so, of scale from the, the so, pickup. But trucks. obviously, they're, they're making money on those less expensive pickup trucks. Yes. George from Brooklyn asks, how concerned should Ford be, Ford be about Lincoln sales performance? It's too early. I, I don't think they, they should be as it, concerned. It's the dealers who have to worry. Yeah, the dealers have to worry right now. But, you know, it's too early to just say, oh, we got to do something else. RTK42C asks, do you have any insight into the upcoming Buick that will be, quote, unquote, much more beautiful Panamera? Is this supposed to be a four-door coupe, maybe a modern Invicta? Wow, yeah, you, there's you, a cool name. Well, we've been, yeah, that'd be a great name. Of yeah. course, the other name. They wanted the Riviera. Uh, the other, I, I that's the other that. name floating yeah. was Riviera, and uh, supposedly rear-wheel drive on the uh, Omega platform, and uh, to differentiate it from Cadillac, uh, four-door coupe so-called four-door coupe uh, style to it. I will complain about Rivieras with more than two doors. <laughs> I agree. I mean, well, I, I think Buick needs a drop-dead gorgeous design statement two-door coupe uh, Riviera. Yeah. But. Yeah, not much volume in that. I agree. I mean, Riviera was the name for the two-door hardtops before there was a Riviera, and the Super and Roadmaster Riviera. But you know what? Uh, it's better than giving it a three-letter name. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Alexander Karabitsis asks, I saw spy shots of the BMW 4 Series Grand Coupe, and it's really hard to tell, tell the difference between that and the 3 Series. How do you guys think BMW will market the 4 Series Grand Coupe? Is he just talking about the 4 Series Coupe or the... No, this is oh, the, the, uh, this is the 3 Series based version of the... Uh, similar to the... Oh, right, uh, right, right. Ungainly 5 Series Grand Coupe. And I'm trying to remember, you know... Uh, it's, oh, um, n not the GT. This is like the, oh, like right. the 6 oh, Series uh, Grand Coupe. I'm sorry. So yeah, you, I'm it's, a four, it's a 3 Series with fatter doors and the bigger, wider haunches and a lower roof and is it, it's it, another, more sex appeal that just makes you want to whip out your wallet and pay more money for it. it. It's another four door with a with a two door coupe name because yeah. of the four series. I I, I'm sorry, I got those mixed up. You're right. Um, just the fact we're we're they have one of those too, a three series. Just the fact yeah, we're GT. talking about. I mean, BMW has just gone off the rails with their segmentation. I mean, it's just ridiculous. They, they have. They're just you know. Well, I just resent that it seems to be taking their eye off the ultimate driving machine idea. Oh, it which is, is just like I said, you get in a standard five series. And you drive around, and it's just like, yeah, what's the deal here? Yeah. What's the point? Well, look, as you all know, uh, you know, they're, they're following, everybody's doing what everybody else is doing. So they have to match Audi and match Mercedes-Benz model for model, basically, and vice versa. You know, each of the three brands are doing that, and that's helping proliferate the, uh, the lineup. Does that come from dealers, or does that come from the executives who are sitting there looking at their product lineup. Gary, you've met German executives. <laughs> ben, let's uh, let's let's hear from Youngblood in uh, Cleveland about the Mustang. Cleveland, Ohio. 
the December 2013 cover of Car and Driver had the uh, the new 2015 Mustang. I'm just wondering if you guys, uh, I like your your guys' opinion on it, whether it lives up to all the hoopla that they uh, had before the actual vehicle was leaked. The actual car Thank will. You. That was not the actual car. Good that job. was an artist rendition. It's wrong in a bunch of areas that the right car improves upon uh, in terms of, I think, all of them. There are things that are ungainly about that car on the cover. And we have uh, so it's, so it's Evos, more, but, Evos yeah. and Mustang, right? And so let's say, let's say that's a continuum. Where where is I don't it? think way over here. There's not way over Evos. Yeah, there's no. E, there's very little Evos. And no, I mean you could sort of say maybe the grill shape is a little, but I mean it was always a little that way to begin with. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I think as a car, it's going to be light years uh, better than what we know as a Mustang. So uh, let's hear from uh, the caller in Albany, Ben. Uh, hi, this is Jeff W. from Albany, New York. Um, about two to three weeks ago, it was announced in the media that Mark Royce had to, uh, or he voluntarily gave up his Facebook um, page or whatever in regards to a uh, response that he had, you know, in regards to, you know, some people questioning uh, GM's declining market share, et cetera. Um, I was wondering if there's any more to that story. It didn't really seem like that big of a deal. I didn't understand why it seemed like he kind of made out in the media. It was almost like he was being uh, punished or something. Um, just one of the panel thoughts. Bye. I don't know if there was any punishment. I, you know, I, Facebook I dropped off punishment? Facebook for a, a while ago, but I think he had a response to something about declining market share, and and it had declined, and it, it's back up a little bit this year. Yeah. Uh, it's hovering close to 18%, and this gets back to what uh, GM management said back after the bankruptcy or during the bankruptcy that the way it was restructured was that they should be able to make money uh, with 18 percent market share in the U.S. and uh, was it 10 or 12 million I think it was 12 million uh, annual volume. So now we've got a higher annual volume and they're just a little bit below 18 percent. But on the social media side of this thing you got to imagine that the PR you know powers that be at all the big three really wish everyone would just put their little devices away because it's just so easy to say something that you regret, you know, in the heat of something. I think you know, we love when yeah, Ralph uh, Gill engages us on Twitter. You know, he says some wonderful things. But you know, And just like politicians, uh, the, the executives are so much, uh, you know, they're, they're so much on point and so much, um, you know, rehearsed in any setting where they speak with us. That to have a little bit of that is really it's, it's I, lovely. I, I think it, I think it works not just for us, but it should work for the the enthusiasts, for the people who are interested in where the auto market is going, and uh, and especially considering that General Motors has had a very uh, heavy clamp down on leaks in the last few years. We've heard of people getting fired just for saying anything to us. Uh, to have a little bit of that looseness uh, goes a long way. Mark Royce is not going to say anything that's going to yeah. get him into big trouble. On that note, it's time to douse the campfire, kids. Uh, we've reached the end of the road for tonight's show. I'd like to thank Todd Lassa from Automobile. Todd, how can they, where are you on Twitter? Where am I? I'm on Twitter, uh, am under slash Lassa, uh, and um, also uh, Occasionally uh, writing commentary blogs at um, at automobilemag.com and of course in the magazine. Yeah, and Frank Marcus. MT underscore Marcus. I promise not to blow up your Twitter feed. <laughs> <laughs> and Gary Vaslash from Automotive Design and Production, and he, they can find you at uh, autofieldguide.com. Yes. And I'm at autoextremist.com, as you already know. My Twitter account is Peter M. DiLorenzo instead of Auto Extremist. And um, you can friend AutoLine at Facebook.com slash AutoLine Network. And you can follow AutoLine on Twitter at Twitter.com slash AutoLine. And we'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, John and I will see you next week in L.A. for a special edition of the show. And uh, that's it for tonight. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion. Visit our website, autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday nights at 
6 p.m. Eastern. Get your daily news fix with AutoLine Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with AutoLine This Week. There's all that and much more at AutoLine.tv.